they love it so much, a lot of them end up double majoring. So we're the people that steal them from other departments. But it's good because they, you know, they spread their learning on. I realize the concept of the map is changing. You know, the discipline itself is becoming more dynamic and definitely the audience is getting younger. Um, and we just don't want our class to be just stuck in traditional softwares. Like we're, we are disciples of the traditional stuff. That's how we learned it and we, we love it. But, you know, it's all starting to intermingle. We want to teach it that way. We want it to be on the latest thing. Um, you know, and we don't see that what, you know, the, the work that we've done with undergraduates, I can see this being done at a high school level if, if we prep it in the right way. Um, and that's why I have that up there. This is actually from uh, a book uh, for my four-year-old sons that I got when they were two. So I believe in geographic learning at very early on. So they actually know what the word cartographer is, but that's just because their mom's a geek. But anyway. So the projects that we've done so far. So we've done this twice already, and we're about to embark on our third project this fall. So the first time we did this, uh, I did it on my lonesome uh, with a, a GIS class about three years ago. And I had just been to the crisis crisis mappers conference and I was like, ooh, OSM, this is cool, have to teach. So I took on this project where I made up this like fictitious, we work for an agency, we're going to map an unmapped city. So I just looked at a natural disaster hotspot list, picked a city that there was Yahoo imagery for at the time that had very little OSM um, and that, you know, that we could, we could work with. So divided it up between my students and they all got, you know, so many kilometers squared and they had to work in it. They were graded on the quality of their work, on the coverage of the, the areas that they did. They only had to digitize roads at the time. And then they were also responsible for negotiating the topology, if you're familiar with that word. So, you know, the quality of the joins between their cells and the neighboring cells, because we didn't have any sophisticated way of m checking out who owned what. So they were graded on their ability to work with their classmates and make it seamless. So it was hell of a lot of work for me and afterwards I was like oh god I'm not doing that again but it worked really well the students enjoyed it and I was like okay there's got to be a better way of doing this and the next time we we embarked on it was with the American Red Cross so a, an alum of our department works for the international services there and we I had done another open source project we had developed some quantum GIS modules for him to, to use one of my other classes did this and he's like do you want to repeat that OSM thing and I was like oh god that was a lot of work it was fun He's like, well, there's this new awesome thing called the tasking manager. Everybody familiar with tasking manager? Come on, give me a wave so we'll know how detailed to go. Okay. So he's like, you can cut out your area and you can assign, you know, areas to people and they can cut it out and it's nice and clean and it just makes the whole process of, of giving work to people easier. So we're like, okay, I like that. I like the sound of that. So uh, we worked with the American Red Cross and we digitized two communities in Colombia, Rio Negro and a part of the city called Bucaramanga. Um, most of the line work was already done there, so we focused on buildings. Um, and we also worked in a, a, um, a community in Indonesia called uh, Silatap. Salatan, thank you. Um, and uh, we digitized a lot of buildings. So the point there was that we were creating the, the, the groundwork for disaster preparedness. And the, the local chapters of the Red Cross there were going to turn what we digitized into walking papers and take it from there. It was just we had that captured mass of, of bodies that we're going to digitize it and it would be checked up. So that has been done and dusted and that worked really, really well this time around. And uh, our project that we plan for the fall is with a new partner, uh, the Geocenter at USAID, which was all through friendly relationships with our friends at the Red Cross. And they're interested in doing something similar for Kathmandu, again, for disaster preparedness. And our students would work um, on digitizing mostly building footprints and stuff like that uh, for disaster preparedness, GIS. And we're kind of stepping it up a notch. The two previous projects had just been with my class and had been with more senior students who were comfortable with GIS topology tracing. They learned how to use JOSM really, really easily. We're going to embark on this with complete newbies who don't really know GIS or mapping new geographers. It will be Richard's class, my class, and another class. So we're, we're talking about the bones of 100 students will work on a project over two weeks. So it's going to, we're scaling it up and we're uh, changing it up a little bit and we'll be interested to, to, to hear what you think of what we want to do. So Richard is going to talk about the workflow that we've used up to now um, and uh, see what you think of it. And I'll speak to you again before the end. Hi, everybody. Um, so when we were developing this, um, this, this sort of lab for our students, there were sort of two main components we had to come up with. First one was our actual preparation in our own workflow. So the first thing, um, as Nuno was talking about earlier, was identifying a, um, an actual area to work. And through working with the Red Cross, they actually identified the areas that we're going to work in and focus on um, for us. So we had two areas in uh, Colombia, Rio Negro, and Bucaramanga. 
And we actually added a third, fearing that, uh, or some concerns at least, that there wouldn't be enough work for all the 30 students, 31 students, to actually get something out of this for the two week long project that, we, uh, that we're giving them. So we added the uh, location in uh, Indonesia uh, to sort of, sort of add some more beef and more oomph to the, uh, to the project itself. Following this, we needed a way to help um, sort of manage the actual work and, get, and divide it up to the students uh, equally. Originally, when Nula did this um, in Bangladesh, uh, the first time three years ago, she used the fishnet tool of ArcGIS. Basically, that just creates a matrix of evenly sized um, squares over your area of interest. This time, um, Tasking Manager had been developed, and we were introduced to it, and we said, oh, this would be fantastic. This is what we used. And we saw a number of people here have actually used Tasking Manager. We have a few slides here um, showing you from, uh, from Tasking Manager. Now, as we had three different geographic regions, we had three different jobs created in Tasking Manager. Um, and we used this to identify each of the uh, areas and to divide up the cells for these students. Uh, we also included um, a description part of the, uh, in Tasking Manager. So anybody who read the job could see that it was for the American Red Cross. GW students were working on it. And um, the initial one we actually had, you know, please leave us alone because it's used for grading with, with students. As well, for anybody who's not that familiar with Tasking Manager, essentially what you do is you locate your area in the map on the right, you zoom in, you simply digitize a box, and you can sort of see the thick, sort of purplish looking box. That was sort of he heads up digitized over the area of interest, and then you basically tell Tasking Manager, make my grid, and it creates this matrix of cells. Um, we also use the workflow tab. So as students would go into Tasking Manager, they would have an, um, a sort of refresher of what was required and how to use the Tasking Manager as they work through their um, assignments. And again, we have one for each of our three areas. Now, when a student actually finds their cell and they want to work on it, again, just briefly going over what happens in Tasking Manager, they select the cell that they want to use. It sort of highlights in yellow. And then you're also given the option of bringing this information to JOSM Potlatch or create walking papers. We were using JOSM in our class. Uh, so students were uh, introduced to that, which I'll talk about in a little, in, in a little bit. But the nice thing with Tasking Manager, uh, which made life a lot easier than it did for Nula the first time around, is that when you select your cell and you select JOSM, of course, it actually takes that data from OSM and loads it into JOSM for you. So you have the data that you need in your area right in front of you, ready for edits. So the next thing um, that we wanted to do was take these grids that we created in Tasking Manager and bring them into ArcGIS because we still needed to add some information to those cells to help us manage and help with our housekeeping and, and uh, organization of the, uh, of the data itself. So one of the first things we did was did a, a visual inspection of each cell uh, with Bing imagery underneath and determine if it was sort of high density or low density. Essentially, if over 50% of the cell was covered in um, urbanized development, we call it high density. So each cell was then designated as low density or high density. We have wanted to assign each cell um, to a particular student, or actually assign a student a number of cells. So we want to identify um, the same number of cells to, for each student, so we had a sort of equitable division of labor for everybody. So this is simply what we did. Um, we brought it into, we took it out of ArcMap, each of the uh, task command, sorry, we took the, the cells out of task manager, brought it into ArcMap, here we see a screenshot, and I've simply populated the, um, each cell with the name of the student to which the cell has been assigned and the unique ID that we have uh, made for the, uh, in the database. Looking at the database a little more closely here, um, as you can see, we have an assigned to field, which is the student's last name. We have a unique identifier for each cell. So if there was a problem or a question about a particular cell, we can simply look to the unique identifier and identify it right away. A density field showing a cell being designated as low or high. And then we also added a key field because within these regions that were identified by the Red Cross, they also identified specific areas that they were particularly interested in. So we wanted to make sure that we identified the cells that covered those areas of particular interest to make sure they were covered fully. And we also used that to sort of cherry pick which students would actually be assigned those students because, uh, those cells rather. Because some students obviously will routine, uh, routinely submit quality work, and we want to make sure some of our, our sharper students were assigned these cells. They had no idea we were doing this, but this is all for our own sort of housekeeping and maintenance. Okay, so the second part of, of getting one of these projects off the ground is engaging the students. And right from the beginning, um, from the very first lecture, Nula introduced that this OSM project would be coming up. And so she was prepping them all, uh, all the weeks leading up to this uh, kickoff of this project, which happened about halfway through the semester. 
So from the very beginning, she gave them a, sort of a brief introduction into what OSM was. She had them uh, create accounts for OSM. She had to, gave them readings, um, also a, a tutorial on JOSM, introducing them that you know, JOSM was going to be using, uh, being used for editing. And so they would have to get familiar with it, have a work manual that they could read through um, to get sort of prepping in, uh, in getting ready for this, uh, this assignment. When we actually kicked off this, uh, this lab, um, we had actually uh, Ian uh, Valletta from Mapbox come in and do a demo and do some training with our students on JOSM. And he did a great job showing um, the students, not only explaining a little bit about OSM, um, but uh, showing them the tool in JOSM and showing some tips and tricks. So we had all the students in the lab and working and there was, um, they were able to sort of play with the tools and ask questions and um, Ian's experience really helped because he's much more experienced with it than uh, Newler and myself. So we really appreciate him coming in and doing that. Um, again, working with the students, we also wanted to give them an idea of what they are contributing to and sort of get them excited about what it is they were doing because they were to treat this as um, working for a client. American Red Cross, we're a client. They can, they've come to us, wanted this uh, information created and they were actually contributing to a much larger project. Most times students, they are given an assignment, they do it, they hand it to an instructor, they, uh, it gets created, it comes back to them and then they throw it in a drawer or throw it in the garbage bin or whatever. But here, not only are they getting graded, but all the work they're doing actually matters because people will actually be, literally be using the information that they're, uh, that they're creating. So we're sort of trying to build some excitement and realize that they're part of a larger group, part of a larger organization, and actually contributing to something that really matters to people on the ground in these countries. Um, we also explained to them the, um, how much work they actually had to do, which they're, of course, curious about. And with this intermediate GIS class, each student was given 12 cells to digitize, 12, 12 tiles. They had three to four high density and eight to nine low density. And each cell was approximately 300 meters uh, by 300 meters, um, which was, uh, you know, can be quite of, uh, challenging in a very densely populated area, but the students seemed to handle it, uh, handle it fairly well. If it were more junior students, probably gonna scale that back, uh, scale that back some either by size and by number of cells. Um, the last thing we had to create was uh, some navigation aids for the students because with the information, with the assignment of the cells that we created uh, using the grid created in task manager um, that we used in ArcMap, we assigned the students and low, high and low density, et cetera, in ArcMap. That information couldn't be transferred into tasking manager. So as a student went to tasking manager to identify their cell, they didn't have that information in front of them in tasking manager. So we created these navigation aids for each of the study areas. So here we have Bukaramanga with all the cells, well, all the tiles that were created, and then the name and a unique identifier for that cell um, for, for each of the students. So we had a handful of these handouts created um, for the students to check. We also made some poster size um, uh, uh, <laughs> diagrams of these, uh, these maps, put them on the wall, and then we also handed them um, some stickers. So as they completed a cell, we had them put a sticker on it showing that it was complete. So we got sort of a low tech, but kind of a cool visualization tool on the wall in the lab where students could, um, and everybody else could see how the progression of the digitizing was going and the project was going throughout the time. The last aid we had was basically a screenshot or a dump of our attribute table where students can see alphabetically um, look up their name and then look at all the cells that they had been assigned for the entire project. So between that, they would use those handouts and then look at tasking manager, identify their cells and bring it down. And the last thing that uh, we came up with was the suggestion of a mapping party that would be after hours. And this would be where everybody would come in together, <coughs> pardon me, and we would just make, make it fun, but also make it optional. So during that class, when we kicked off the lab, uh, Nula asked for sort of a, you know, raise of hands who would be interested. Pretty much every uh, student in the class raised their hand, they're interested in coming in on a Friday night and doing this. So to make it more formal, um, Nula created an Eventbrite uh, event for students to RSVP. And there was a large result, um, a large uh, number of students that RSVP'd. So we went ahead with it and we had um, pizza, we had some pop, we had ice cream sandwiches. We also had a group shark account set up where students can um, submit uh, and, and put in their own uh, playlist. Nula gave us the credentials and the email so we can all put our own favorite songs. But she also had a caveat of she would veto anything from Justin Bieber or Taylor Swift. So, and, and fair enough. But somehow Carly Rae Jepsen got in there. I don't know. Call me maybe. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Um, but again, Ian came down um, for that uh, mapping party. Robert Bannock at the Red Cross, who was actually helping us organize this, came down as well and helped with the students. 
Um, and the students actually got a lot out of it because they were able to ask questions or actually working on their actual assigned tiles. And um, a lot of them got a good chunk of their assignment done. And so it was a lot of fun. We had music playing, eating pizza, and actually it's, it was around 9 o'clock when the last couple of students left. And they're like, Richard, are you kicking us out at 9? I'm like, yes. It's 9 o'clock. It's Friday. There's a beer with my name on it, and it's not here in the lab. You know, get out. Um, so then we all went for a pint afterwards, um, and, uh, and all students seemed to have a, have a good time. Uh, and just very quickly, one of, the, uh, one of the maps from Rio Negro, this is what the OSM looked like when we started the project. A um, few of the major roads and uh, sort of you know, a river feature through there. And afterwards, when, this, when the project was done after this two weeks, um, a number of the buildings, more roads, land features are all been included. And all the digitizing was done using Bing imagery. We had hoped to get some more higher resolution imagery, um, but that sort of fell through at the last minute, so we used Bing, and the students were able to complete their assignments. And so, and actually, Rio was probably the smallest of the three communities, obviously, um, but we didn't put the other ones up because they're super busy, but, you know, they definitely got an awful lot of work done. So, um, I guess the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, why is OSM in the classroom uh, different to, you know, having your regular ma mapping party, having volunteers who show up and even setting it up and tasking manager and people kind of picking and choosing, oh, this looks interesting, I'll map here, I'll map there. You know, we need to be equitable when you're assigning a volume of work. You're grading people on this. You need to be fair to them. Everybody needs to get the same, um, and there needs to be a, a systematic way of you grading it. So that was why Richard, you know, poured over every single cell, assigned them high density, low density. Um, you always struggle with them by giving them too much work, to, uh, too little, that kind of thing. We wanted those to have manageable uh, grid cells so that they, you know, could sit down in one session and work on them, you know, all that kind of thing. So that had to be catered for. And most people were happy with their assignments, and some students, you know, maybe got a little bit shafted and ended up with maybe some of their lows were really closer to high kind of thing. So, you know, we could negotiate that with them as it worked along. But most people were pretty happy. You need to be able to track what students did. You have to, the whole process of assignment and, and tasking manager, as wonderful as it is, you know, doesn't really allow us to do that. So that necessitates the whole importing out of one thing, bringing it into another software, putting people's names on it, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you need to prevent that overlap as much as possible. We love the checking out, but, you know, not having the assignment. Um, uh, it didn't help. Uh, so this is, you know, obviously you've seen already what it looked like in Tasking Manager, and then this is, you know, what we had to come up with in order to uh, assign it in ArcMap itself. So if there was some way of making what we did here be part of that over there, that would be awesome. And I'm almost done. So uh, where do we want to go from here? Um, we think for our class in the fall that we're probably going to work with ID. Uh, we went to the, the launch of, of ID at Mapbox, and we got, we got super excited, like light bulbs went on, and we went, Ooh, we could have the babies do this. This is easy, and there's lots of them. And, uh, you know, the intro GIS classes that we teach are packed. They're oversubscribed. We have students from all these departments, and sometimes that's the only GIS class they take. You know, they want to learn a little bit, and then they run with it from there. So we really wanted to integrate OSM open source learning into that class, because that might be their, their last brush with it. So ID seemed like a really viable way of doing that. Um, but, you know, could Tasking Manager work with ID the way it had worked with Jossum? Learning curve for Jossum was super easy for intermediate GIS students. They, you know, clicked around a bit and went, okay, you know, we understand how this works. So could we make that happen with ID? It would, it would definitely uh, really help things. Um, you know, we want this to be for non-GIS folk too. Richard and I, you know, what started us uh, coming here to, to do this was we proposed putting together, writing up a little module or a workflow of how we prep this class so that other classes could use it, either in our department, other universities, you know, kind of contribute something back in a neat little package so people wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel that nearly drove me crazy three years ago. Um, but we see it as, go, you know, with ID, it's changed again. So we've decided to wait until after our fall class and we'll run this final project in, um, in September to write our module. And, you know, a lot of those questions will hopefully be answered. But then maybe other departments, history, biology, public policy, could use this module if they didn't have to maybe integrate the GIS software in there too, or if we made it as easy as possible. Because you could use quantum, we actually did use quantum sometimes for some of the stuff we did, so you can d definitely go open uh, source if needs be. So the ideal module, easy to use for both the instructor, we don't want to make you be a GIS person or even a geographer uh, for that matter, and also easy for the student, 
for everybody to use, less over and back, because like right now the workflow is like in, out, up, down, over, back, add this, add that, and you know, that's fine, we do it, the students don't see it, it looks nice when we present it to them, but that's not necessarily uh, the workflow that every uh, professor is going to uh, want to have to deal with. So I'll just leave you with the cat in the hat. I'm, I'm definitely more infantile. The zombies are more trendy. I'm probably dealing with the preschoolers with my little cat in the hat, but I like him, and he works. But, um, you know, going forward, you know, we're interested to hear what you guys think. You know, maybe some of you work on some of these tools, and you could see a way for these to work. You could give us some ideas on, on how we could do what we're doing better, because we want this to be something that other people use, not just us. We can continue the way we are quite happily and do cool stuff with our students, but... I want other people to do this with their students. And if we can help do that, that's where we want this to go. So um, we welcome your questions. Thank you. Um, hi, Mikkel. He just asked if we could publish the curriculum openly. As far as I'm aware, our teaching materials and products, we've always been told, are our personal property. Um, so anything that we would choose to do in that vein, um, I, I don't know what the policy would be about putting it on, like, let's say, GW site, but I'm sure we could put up a site of our own and put it up there. I don't think they'd worry. And, and our chair is very supportive of this. She thinks it's cool, as do a lot of our colleagues. So I, I don't perceive that being an issue. I'll try, I'll try and remember all those. I have a bad head. I'm like the goldfish in that bowl there. Uh, after 30 seconds, I forget things. But you asked if, um, you know, we made students aware of other OSM things that were going on. Um, did they continue on afterwards? Um, and how involved they'd been? Was that like the Be Quiet music? Oh, okay. All right. I can, I can answer that. Afterwards. Yes, we introduced them to other things. Some of them worked on other projects. We brought them to other events with us and stuff like that. Um, I can answer that after the